everyone. My name is Robert Breedlove. Uh, as Michelle said, I'm the host of the What Is Money show. I've spent the past six years, I guess, going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and studying the history of money, uh, its impact on humanity and civilization. And what I'm going to try to do today is distill a few of those things that I have learned uh, with a focus on the ethical and moral dimensions of money and how it influences us. This is going to be a dense data download, as is kind of typical my style. Uh, like I said, I'll go for about 30 minutes, and then I'll try to leave roughly 10 to 15 minutes open for Q&A. So with that, let's get started. I think the first thing that we have to understand when it comes to money is the nature of private property itself. Now, this is a term that we've had with us for a long time. Uh, really was ratified in the 1215 Magna Carta when King John signed it and it had life, liberty, and inviolable property. We, this was the predecessor document to the U.S. Constitution. We turned that into life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think that was a mistake, but uh, I could be wrong about that. Private property is quite simply the individual's exclusive power to control an asset. So when you own a car, you exclusively have the rights to enjoy that vehicle, but simultaneously you have the responsibility to maintain it. You have to take care of it as well. In other words, property is the relationship between an owner and an asset, and the most basic form of this is just your body, right? You, your consciousness, your willpower, your intellect, controls this machine we call your body. This is the most basic relationship you have. And we take this self-ownership that we all naturally are endowed with, and we go into the world. We create things of value. We plant farms, we build businesses, we trade with one another, we create wealth. But all of it is contained within this normative structure that we call private property. And it's interesting because property only works to the extent that we pretend that it works. You don't actually have the exclusive rights to control assets that you create. You do have it in your body, but you don't necessarily have it in your car, your house, etc. It is this a normative structure that exists to the extent that we all enact its existence, if you will. But it, that enactment or this dramatic play or, or normative structure that we engage in creates very pragmatic results in the real world. This is what made the Industrial Revolution possible and what got us into this lap of luxury we live in today called modernity. So there's an opposite form of this, though. That's private property, where the individual has exclusive control. There is another version of this called socialized property. And that is a form that I would argue does not work at all. Um, there's an old saying that says, when everybody owns everything, nobody takes care of anything. This is a classic tragedy of the commons. As I said earlier, Property, private property rights could equally be called private property responsibilities. When you socialize property, there's no one to take care of the socialized asset. There's no responsibility, there's no incentive to take care of it. So, and these normative structures, just, it may sound a little strange, but we get these very basically. Like, you all showed up here today based on a calendar, I presume, and there was a certain time that we all agreed to meet. Well, guess what? That calendar and the clock only works to the extent that we all believe it exists, right? It's a consensus structure. And we have a lot of these. The calendar, money, nation states, civil liberties, all these things are enacted things that we create. And so I want to read, I'm going to be drawing from a couple of books today. Uh, one is a book titled A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism by Hoppe. Uh, another one is called The Ethics of Money Production by Holzman. And I may mention a, a third to Honest Money by Gary North. And I'll try to cite the authors as I go. But I do want to read this one excerpt from Hoppe in A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Hoppe writes that next to the concept of action, property is the most basic category in the social sciences. As a matter of fact, all other concepts to be introduced in this chapter, aggression, contract, capitalism, and socialism, are definable in terms of property. Aggression being aggression against property. Contract being non-aggressive relationship between property owners. Socialism being an institutionalized policy of aggression against property. 
and capitalism being an institutionalized policy of recognition of property. So this is a concept, I talk about property till I'm blue in the face on the show because I think we have such a poor understanding of it, yet it is fundamental to everything that we do to organize ourselves, as, as Hoppe brilliantly writes here. So when we institute socialized property, or what I would call vileable property, right? It's non-individual property. You're actually institutionalizing aggression itself. And this has a lot of perverse consequences on socioeconomic organization. First and foremost is that it incentivizes consumption over investment. And when we are engaging in the market process, investment is the key to growth, growth of productivity and prosperity. And to the extent that you cannot maintain the fruits of your labor across time, right? If you do not keep 100% of the fruits of your labor, maybe your tax rate is 10%, you only keep 90% of them. That is a reduction in your incentive to invest. You would rather consume the capital than work and create something that someone's going to take from you. So in very simple terms, Theft reduces productivity. Theft reduces your incentive to invest. It, it incentivizes you rather to consume the seed crop rather than, than to plant the seed, for instance. So, and as Hoppe puts in his book, he goes, put drastically, this tendency to uh, consume rather than invest has the tendency to turn philosophers into drunks. So, really strong property has this interesting effect on us that it causes us to engage with the future, a, a, a longer span of the future. And it has this effect called uh, lowering our time preference, which I'll, I'll get into in a bit. So if we don't have confidence in that normative structure, that if we don't have confidence that we're all going to continue to pretend that we all have individual private property rights, if confidence is shaken in that, then we start to consume civilization rather than to build it up. The accumulation of capital is almost indistinguishable from the process of civilization. As we accumulate more wealth, we become more prosperous, we increase our standard of living. Um, that process is supported by investment. If you consume rather than invest, you actually start to decivilize. You, you degrade and dissolve civilization over time. So. I mentioned time preference. This idea of property being viable or socializable is raising our time preference. And what time preference means, it is the rate at which humans value the present relative to the future. And there's a lot of variables that impact and influence time preference, but one very obvious one is just the integrity of money or the integrity of property. If you know you can save in something that will have expanding or at least consistent purchasing power over time, and you know that there's no actions in the world that anyone can do to change that, then you have a huge incentive to delay gratification and invest, right? To spend a little less time fishing with your hands and instead building a fishing pole. And that investment later lets you catch more fish per hour than you could with your hands. And then maybe you build a net and a boat, et cetera, and so on. If you're interested in this topic, it's very fascinating. There's a book called The Bitcoin Standard by Safety and Moose, and I think he spells it out brilliantly. But suffice it to say that when we have property that's aggressively founded or socialized rather than private, we're raising our time preference. This is causing us to be more short-termism and less engaged in the long-term process of building civilization. Now, there are other consequences. Oh, one other thing I should say here. The extent to which theft is permanent rather than intermittent, so the violations of your property, if it's a burglar breaking into your house, right, you can insure against that risk, right? You can get locks, you can get traditional insurance, you could buy a gun. But to the extent that the theft is regularized or institutionalized, as it is with inflation and taxation, you cannot insure against that. So it's even more severe the more regular it is. And this is why um, 
we talk so much about the dangers of taxation and inflation because it's, it's destructive to productivity and destructive to civilization. Now, another consequence of weak property or viable property is that it actually changes the development of our individual character, of our individual moral development. And now, this is a very interesting area that I think is hopefully applicable to what we're talking about today. The more property is viable, the more profitable it is to steal from others. So the more individuals can satisfy their own desires by violating the satisfactions of others, to, by aggressing against others. So there's kind of a simple principle underlying this, that in general, human beings will do whatever is profitable. So what we're describing here with inviolable or less viable property is making theft less profitable. And Hoppe, again, goes through this in his book, saying that, here's, here's another way to say it, perhaps. I always break it down into making or taking, right? There's making of wealth, which is the actual building of a business or planting of a farm, doing of work. And then there's, that's one means of wealth acquisition. The other means of wealth acquisition is taking. You can actually take what the makers make. So to the extent that taking is available as an option, people will engage in it. And so the trick, if you will, to building a sustainable, prosperous civilization is to make theft dangerous, expensive, and risky. And we've come a long way in this respect with things like the rule of law, you know, the U.S. Constitution, some of these foundational documents. Uh, but as we'll see, I think Bitcoin is, is a giant leap in that direction. So Aristotle said something interesting, that man exceeds all other animals in his capacity for imitation. So Hoppe makes the argument that where property is viable, people will engage in this taking strategy, theft, and other people seeing their economic success in that process will st start to adopt a similar strategies over time. And once you start doing that, as, as you know, if you've ever switched a job, you start to develop new skills that may not be applicable to what you used to do, right? You start to forget your old way of being. And so when you do this at scale, you institutionalize the violation of property, you're actually incentivizing people to switch from productive entrepreneurial roles into non-productive political roles. And this is very strange to me because what we're talking about is a structure, uh, the architecture of this normative structure we call property, it's the incentive schema that we're inhabiting and it's actually changing the way human beings develop over time. So we have some say-so in our, you know, we can't change human nature, per se. You can't change, what was it, Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil cuts down the heart of every man. You can't change that. But what you can change are the material incentive structures that pull that line left or right to good or evil. And so I think this is something that's really, really worth thinking about. So in, that, in this way, violating property dissolves character structure and the moral composition of society. You're actually incentivizing people into non-productive, extractive roles and out of productive, as we said. So as this shift occurs, individual character development gets tilted away from, from cooperation and towards aggression. And this is just, this is terrible, right? This is, this is the debasing of that normative structure actually debases our individual character development. Put really simply, hopefully, if you reward non-productive activity, you're going to produce a non-productive society. And a non-productive society is one that fails. Now, hopefully that spelled out what property is a little bit and why it's so important. What I'd like to do now is shift into why inflation is everywhere and always only a violation of private property rights. It is nothing else. You could maybe say it's an optical illusion too, but it's only stealing, it's only violating property. So inflation 
And here I'm going to draw on the book Ethics of Money Production by Goldsman. Uh, all these books are free PDFs online, by the way, and I'll, I'll circulate them after this presentation. Inflation is the extension of the quantity of currency beyond what would arise on the free market. Free market here is shorthand for social cooperation conditioned by the respect for private property rights. So inflation would be currency issuance that is not mutually agreed upon. It, it, it presupposes the implementation of a central bank or some legal monopoly, a group of people that are authorized to print money and a group of people that are not that have the proverbial guns pointed at them and are not allowed to print private property, or print money. So in that way, inflation, th this extension of currency issuance that would otherwise not arise in circumstances of consensual voluntary exchange is itself a violation of private property rights. You could think that if yourself, if you owned a money printing machine and you could press a button, produce new units of money, you could spend that money at full value into the marketplace to acquire goods and services, and everyone else was forced to continue using that money, you would effectively have the means to steal from them. And as a means of incentive, you would probably run that machine until it broke. And indeed, when you look back across human history, that's what we've been doing. We have people that have monopolized money, they'll debase it, they'll clip the coins, or they'll print the money until that machine itself breaks and the process we call hyperinflation. Now, as we've said earlier, private property, this is the fundamental rule of civil society. It's how we can all gather with strangers and have normal human interaction in the world that's nonviolent and peaceful and all these things. The fundamental rule is that whatever you justly acquire, you get to keep, right? This is almost the essence of justice itself, people getting what they deserve. Inflation is a twisting of that rule. You're arbitrarily reallocating wealth from the hands of people saving in dollars, for instance, into the hands of those who can access newly produced dollars first. This is called the Cantillon effect or the redistributive qualities of inflation. It's theft. This is not, I'm not uh, embellishing when I say this. This is mechanically how it operates. And so... In this way, inflation is like an unnatural way of increasing the money supply, whereas it's typical money production, like the mining of gold or Bitcoin, is fundamentally different. And the difference is the cost of production. When you print a new dollar, there's a near zero cost, especially when it's produced inside of an electronic database. These dollars aren't even printed that much anymore. So, you know, control C, control V at the Fed. That's how you produce new dollars. How do you produce new gold? You go out into the world. You invest in mining. You know, first discovery, then mining, then refining, then coinage, then shipping. There's all this cost that goes into the business that prohibits the undue expansion of the gold supply. So gold functions as a really good store of value because it's resistant to inflation or counterfeiting. Whereas the US dollar is inflated ad infinitum, or can be inflated ad infinitum. So this, that's the fundamental difference between, let's say, natural versus unnatural supply inflation. And all of this, by the way, it speaks to the etymological root of inflation itself, which comes from the Latin verb inflare, which means to blow up. So what we're talking about is the blowing up of the money supply and if we believe what Hoppe writes here, leads to the blowing up of civilization itself over time. So, again, people, they, the question's always why. Like, why are we doing this to ourselves? It's self-destructive, it's self-defeating, what's going on? Well, again, people will do whatever is profitable to do. So, the extent to which humans can make inflation or theft less profitable is the extent to which civilization can be made more peaceful, sustainable, and prosperous. Right, this is basic incentives. So I'll read another, and this is a passage from The Ethics of Money Production by Goldsman. 
He writes, economists are usually reluctant to dwell on the moral dimensions of social facts, and rightly so, because moral questions are outside their customary purview. But one does not need to be a moral philosopher to know that certain incomes are illegitimate and that they derive from a violation of the fundamental rule of civil society, respect for private property. And it would be irresponsible even for an economist not to point out that such illegitimate incomes can be obtained and have been obtained very often through an inflation of the money supply. Clearly, such incomes offend any notions of natural justice and are impossible to square with the precepts of Christianity. Thomas Woods is very much on point when he remarks, If there is a principle of Catholic morality according to which such insidious wealth redistribution is acceptable, it is not known to the present writer. There is no moral or ethical justification whatsoever for central banking. This is a system, an anti-capitalistic system, of institutionalized aggression against private property at the heart of every modern economy. I don't mean to be the pessimist in the room, but it is what it is, guys. We've got a big problem, and we need to look at it to deal with it. So, to try to sum up some of this, if debasing currency is a violation of private property, Private property is the incentive structure that encourages the development of peaceful trade, productivity growth, prosperity. Then debasing currency is actually debasing our social morality, our productivity, and our social cohesion. Right? This is like pouring acid on the bonds that hold human civilizations together. And yet we keep repeating this process time and time again. Right? This is what collapsed ancient Rome. You debase the coins, you debase the monetary protocol, you debase the political protocols, the whole thing collapses. So, that's one angle on the problems of inflation. Now I'd like to share with you another one. And this also comes from the ethics of money production, and it describes how central banking itself is an anti-democratic process. So another way to think of the market economy is as a system which caters to the wants of consumers. So we all have wants, and we live in a world of finite resources. We take those wants into the world, trying to get our own satisfied through buying and selling, and also trying to satisfy the wants of others through our craft, through our vocation. And we reconcile that difference, right, between unlimited wants and limited resources through the pricing system. You can do it through contract or you can do it through conflict. The signals that are coordinating all of that activity are price signals. And price, as you may have learned in Economics 101, it arises at the intersection of supply and demand. But when you start debasing currency, some weird, really weird things start to happen. Prices now start to fluctuate based on policy rather than actual buying and selling. So you now, now I can't tell if the price of my house goes up, does that mean more people want to buy houses or does that mean the Federal Reserve just printed $6 trillion over the past 24 months? Right? We're introducing noise into this, this channel that coordinates all economic activity. And this starts to confuse the market process. It's confusing the system of human want satisfaction. And when you flood the market economy with counterfeit currency, the economic body of society starts to cater to the wants of non-productive industries, like government, like banking, like big finance. These are not industries that create anything. These are industries that connect buyers and sellers, borrowers and creditors. Um, it's a necessary function, but it's not something we want to overly enrich. You actually want to minimize the middlemen, the intermediate industries. The more you minimize intermediaries, the more buyers and sellers can engage in actual wealth creation. And again, the debasing of currency reverses this. We start to enrich the intermediaries at the expense of wealth creators. And so as the American economist Frank Fetter observed, he described the unhampered market economy as a grassroots democratic process. 
where in the US at least, one penny equals one market vote. And from this perspective, the imposition of central banking or fiat currency, illegal, again, the legal monopoly, enables the central bank and those nearest the fiat currency spigot to create market votes out of nothing. They're effectively awarding themselves new influence in the process of the market economy by printing money. So we, we often think, as inhabitants of the liberal democracy that is the United States, that going to that ballot box and casting a vote for your favorite politician is the best way to have your voice heard in civil society. But it's fundamentally untrue. What really moves the world are incentives. And among the incentive systems we inhabit, money is one of the strongest. When you buy a house, you are signaling to the market, make more houses, right? It's a real vote that moves real people and real capital. You sell a car, you're signaling to the market to make less cars. A real vote that moves real capital and real people. You go to the ballot box and cast a vote for a politician, you're just voting for a guy that might represent your wishes to some extent, but he's being paid from the proceeds stolen through taxation and inflation. It, there's not a high fidelity of your voice being propagated through that system, but through the market process, there is. So, in a world with central banking, governments, banks, these intermediate functions, they end up holding way more sway over the market process voting system than they otherwise would. Fiat currency is voter fraud, if you want to call it that. Okay? It's disturbing our ability to configure the world to the preferences of all of us collectively. It's, it's, it's concentrating power and influence and wealth into the hands of few. And so just to give you like a mathematical example of how bad this is, this has to do with the nature of fractional reserve banking. This is an example in the ethics of money production. A banker starts out with $25,000. If you only have a 10% reserve ratio, he's only required to keep 10% of that collateral uh, on deposit. He can loan out the rest. So he can issue credit of $250,000, loans of $250,000, and he can take those notes to the federal bank for discounting. He'll get something like $245,000 because he has to pay for the borrow. Uh, the balance, which is the charge for the discounting and the Federal Reserve credit. He can then use as a reserve, which he can use those as a reserve for further loans. So you can extend credit up to 10 times that amount. So that is $2.45 million. And in this situation, the banker with an original capital of $25,000 at a 6% annual interest rate is now collecting $147,000 per year of interest on a capital base of $25,000. How is that justified? This is someone that's just an insider to a legal monopoly that you are not privy to play in that can generate revenues of $147,000 in interest income, non-productive income, extractive income, on a capital base of $25,000. That's just one example, right? It's, just, it's What's the justification? I, I don't see it. Oh, wow, going over time here. So I'm going to skip a couple of these. One I would like to say, I won't get into the details on it. Another consequence of inflation, that pricing signal that is being confused by the production of currency, it's also causing entrepreneurs to overborrow, misallocate capital, and the net outcome of this is that it amplifies the boom and bust business cycle. So the booms and the busts that we've become so accustomed to and we're told is a normal, healthy part of the economy and the central bank is here to help manage and fight, it's like calling the arsonist a firefighter. The central bank is creating the boom and bust economy. And entrepreneurs, the real creators of wealth, are unable to coordinate themselves effectively because the perceptual apparatus, the price itself, the glass through which they're looking, is becoming more and more uh, blurred or fogged by this price signal distortion. So, in conclusion, printing money 
which is more accurately defined as counterfeiting currency. I define gold and Bitcoin as money. I think currency is a layer two on top of that. You know, paper currency was introduced to move gold a lot faster. Um, we don't print money typically, right? We mine money, we mine gold, we mine Bitcoin, but we print currency, we counterfeit currency. And that's what the central bank is. It's a global coordinated currency counterfeiting operation. That's all it does. This has been an irresistible temptation for human beings since the inception of money. Really since the agricultural age, we started trading and accumul accumulating an economic surplus. The most tradable asset in any economy is money. And the monopoly on violence, which is the state, has always sought to monopolize money to, as a means of controlling people. So we have been engaged in this self-destructive, self-deceptive practice for as long as we've been trading with one another. Now, Bitcoin is the first monetary technology in history that is impossible to print, debase, or counterfeit. Now, I know gold was great and it served us well. It has its own limitations, but it's not immune to innovation. There's always the risk that we could have the alchemical breakthrough and figure out how to produce gold, or we could mine the ocean floor, or mine an asteroid. Bitcoin does not suffer from the same technological risk that gold does. And seeing that inflation is such a disastrous moral cancer on the world, for the reasons I highlighted earlier, proponents of Bitcoin believe that incorruptible money is the antidote to this sickness. If we can take away or at least reduce the option or the profitability of the option of taking from people, then people who are naturally wealth seeking, which is all of us, will engage in making. We can actually change the incentive structure we inhabit such that we change our individual character and moral development pathways. It's fascinating, fascinating. So in this way, you know, if printing money is an addiction we have been unable to break, perhaps money that can't be printed or counterfeited is a rehab for humanity, right? Maybe we'll have this great awakening that we keep exacerbating the boom and bust business cycle. I would say exacerbating the boom and bust civilizational cycle. We keep compromising civilizational integrity by the printing of money and the violation of property. Through the introduction of a technology that is not cost-effectively viable, then perhaps we can increase the integrity of the systems we organize ourselves into just by building on a different money. So the extent, I'll set it a different way, maybe the extent to which property is made inviolable is the extent to which people shift into productive and entrepreneurial roles and out of non-productive and political roles. So we can depoliticize this world that's going mad with politics right now just by having an unbreakable, inviolable monetary standard. So, since debasing currency is a violation of private property, and private property is the incentive structure that encourages the development of peaceful trade and productivity growth, debasing currency is debasing social morality, productivity, and social sustainability, as we said earlier. So in theory, then, a money that cannot be debased, inflated, or counterfeited can allow us to construct a civilization characterized by unparalleled social morality, productivity, and sustainability. And I think that is the great promise and the fundamental importance of Bitcoin. Thank you. And we've got six minutes for Q&A. Maybe 15, 10, 15. Sure thing. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is uh, elaborate on the concept of time preference, and then I'll touch on the properties of good money. So again, time preference is the rate that one prefers present to later satisfaction. It's a little bit counterintuitive. The higher your time preference, 
the more short-term thinking you are. The lower your time preference, the more long-term oriented you are. So at low time preference, good, high time preference, bad, basically. The simple, a simple example, again, it's laid out in the Bitcoin standard, describes a Robin Crusoe type situation. A guy is alone on an island. He's trying to catch fish with his bare hands. Maybe he can catch one fish per hour. So he spends eight hours a day catching eight fish. Now, this guy can choose to maybe forego present satisfaction, eat six fish per day, fish for six hours, and spend the other two hours building a fishing pole or trying to build a fishing pole. Maybe he does this for a week, say seven days, so he's put in 14 hours into building a fishing pole. All of a sudden, he gets it done. Going into week two, he can now catch, I don't know, five fish per hour with a fishing pole. So he's increased his productivity 5x. Well, now, all of a sudden, this guy can fish for, to get his eight fish per day, what? 1.6 hours a day to, meet, to eat his eight fish a day, and he has the rest of the day leisure time. Now, he has a choice. He could leisure, right, and go sleep under the shady tree, or he can take that free time he afforded himself through the innovation of the fishing rod, and he can engage in further innovation. He could go build a boat, build a net, build whatever it may be that might help increase his productivity for catching fish or other things. And the next innovation, let's say the boat or the net, right, might increase that fish per hour number to 10 per hour or 20. And it, this, it's that process, it's that virtuous cycle of delaying gratification, engaging in the construction of tools that, that amplify your productivity, giving you more free time to do as you please, but if you choose to engage in further innovation, you're lowering your time preference over time. It takes longer and longer to produce these things. And the example I think he uses at the end of it is um, the end of that process. There's a, there are fishing vessels today that take 30 years to construct. All right, they're massive. They're, they're connected to global supply chains. They have materials from all over the world. There's all this human cooperation and planning that goes into it. But once you build one of these things, you're catching tens of thousands of fish per hour. Right? It's, it's unbelievable. That is wealth. That's how you create wealth. We try to increase our productivity, which is to say increasing the results we can accomplish per unit of effort. So it's that process of capital accumulation, this delayed gratification that leads to investment, that leads to innovation, that leads to the accumulation of capital that lowers our time preference and increases civilization. We just can satisfy more human wants. We increase the carrying capacity of the planet that way. So if we're gonna be fruitful and multiply, there is no other way. So that's time preference, hope that yeah, and the, so the properties of good money. Now, a lot of people will list a lot of properties of good money. Um, I prefer to use Gary North's from Honest Money. Again, a free PDF online. Highly recommend you check it out. He's a brilliant writer. It's very accessible. He narrows down the five properties of good money to divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. I'll try to explain them really quickly. Divisibility, you want your money to be able to buy you coffee or buy you a house. So you need to be able to separate and combine it into different units to transact at different scales. Kind of obvious. Durability, you don't want your money to break down or corrode over time. Gold is better money than oranges, right? Oranges are gonna rot. You put all your economic energy in oranges, in two weeks they're gonna be rotten and you're gonna be broke. Gold has a lot of durability. That's a good monetary property. Portability is another one. The ability to move money across space. You're going to buy stuff with people in other parts of the world. You're going to have to move the money. This is actually an area where gold is not good. It's not very portable. So we had to have gold-backed currency to augment the portability of money and make it more useful. Recognizability is the capacity to test the authenticity of the money. You've probably heard the term sound money. That was the that was in reference to the sound, the very particular sound a gold coin would make when dropped from a certain height that attested to, it was kind of like a time-honored technique for testing the veracity of the money. They also used to engage in the assaying of gold, so they'd actually stop and test it. 
Uh, this is also the reason we introduced coinage. Rather than needing to stop and test money at every transaction, we just have an issuer stamp a certification saying this gold coin is one ounce, and we now trust the issuer rather than the individual market participant. Finally, there's scarcity. Scarcity is not purely a supply side function. Scarcity occurs wherever demand exceeds supply. But the weird thing about money is that demand for money always exceeds supply. Because money is a call option on all the stuff, people have unlimited wants, money's always scarce. So the money that tends to win in free market competition is the one with the least flexible supply. That's what gold was. That's what gold, gold became money because it was the most, well, monetary metals were the most divisible, durable, recognizable, portable monetary technologies we had available. Of the monetary metals, gold had the least flexible supply, which made it the best store of value and ultimately the premier asset on the planet. And that's also why Bitcoin outcompetes gold, because Bitcoin has an absolutely inflexible supply. It has a hard cap of 21 million. We've never had a fixed supply asset in the world. I argue that Bitcoin's the discovery of absolute scarcity. Please. Hi. Um, a ton of this resonates with me and I'm sure a lot of people here. Um, right now we have a lot of very powerful people trying to change the world. Um, you know, your, your Klaus Schwab's, your Soros's, your Gates. Just wondering if anybody, you know, from your camp has tried to uh, talk sense to them. <laughs> Uh, well, okay. I would have to try to define my camp first. I would assume that means Bitcoiners. And Bitcoiners talk a lot more smack than they do sense. So, no, I don't think anyone's tried to talk sense to them. I, I would actually throw out Alex Gladstein here. He's a Human Rights Foundation. He has a level head in talking to these guys. Much more level headed than I. Um, my overall thesis on this, though, is you're not going to talk sense into a Klaus Schwab or equivalent. The guy's ossified in his behavioral patterns. What you can do is change the incentives that we're pouring future humans into. And that changes their pathways of individual character and moral development. I think that is the most, as far as engineering goes, that's the best w thing we can do to deal with human nature. Now, of course, there's a lot of other ways, right, like religion, philosophy, all these things that are other approaches to dealing with human, uh, what do you say here, human corruption, I guess. But I think material incentives are probably the strongest, most effective way to deal with that. Kind of, sorry, it's not exactly a good answer to your question, but that's how no, I see it. No, it is. Yeah. It's, we, you think we have to go around. <laughs> we definitely have to go around. What, what there's the old saying, I can't remember who said this, don't spend your energy fighting the old, spend your energy building the new. So that's what most Bitcoiners are trying to do, I think. So, yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I think a lot of the Catholics here will appreciate if just to say, um, if inflating currency is about destroying private property, how should we build systems to distribute wealth? Or better yet, how does Bitcoin serve to transfer wealth to those who need it? That's a good question. Um, I think the most important thing we can implement in our socioeconomic systems is absolute consent. Um, this is a very <laughs> interesting area because uh, when I speak out against taxation and inflation, it's often the victims of taxation and inflation that rush to its defense. Um, and li this is, a, again, it's a sensitive area. So some libertarians would describe this as domestication. When you domesticate your dog... You are the dog's master, right? That's what the process of domestication is. And if you attack me, well, my dog's probably going to attack you if I've trained him well, I've domesticated him. I've created a master-slave relationship with the dog. So it seems to me like we've been so conditioned to the normalization of theft that we actually think we need it. Like we need theft to build roads. We need theft to build schools. 
But I don't see it that way. Maybe we did. Maybe we did in the technological realities we've inhabited up until this point. Maybe it's just human nature had to express itself that way. But again, if you're focused on the incentives that actually drive human action, the trick is to make theft and coercion as expensive as possible so as few people as possible engage in it. And to the extent that you decrease theft and coercion, you're increasing all this capital accumulation and prosperity. That's, that's the only real way to ensure mechanically that you're engaging in the process of civilization. So when I hear, and I think the end of your question, you, you talked about wealth being distributed to those who need it. As I talked about a little bit with a, describing the market process as a democratic system, that's exactly what it's doing. That's exactly what it's doing. Now, I know this isn't perfect, right? There's people that are in terrible accidents, and maybe they lose their ability to work, produce an income, etc. But if we're creating a world that has much more cumulative wealth, aggregate wealth, which is to say the standard of living for all of us is rising, the cost of living is declining, then we are each more capable of engaging in altruistic behavior, right? You're, and there have been studies on this. There's one by the UN that says, I think it's above $5,000 in uh, GDP per capita. People have a higher propensity to care about the environment and to be willing to give resources to ecological preservation, things like this. It's pretty obvious, right? Once your basic needs are met, and you're producing an income above your needs, and you see problems in the world, well, you want to go out and solve them. It's not an absolute. Sure, there's people that will just hoard wealth and hoard wealth, but that the, the people hoarding wealth, which is also a value judgment, does not outweigh the total wealth creation that's possible by just making things more consensual. And so we're really fortunate in this way that the moral path, right, consent, uh, non-aggression, all of these things, just happens to be also the productive path. Because if, that, if it were the opposite, we'd be in a real pickle. Right? If it was always profitable to be immoral and aggressive against people, well, then we would have a hard time civilizing. So um, I think ultimately the unhampered free market process is the best means of creating and allocating wealth in accordance with the configuration of consumer wishes. So the most people get the most wants satisfied. Hey, Robert. Love your work. Love your podcast. Uh, obviously, you. you love Bitcoin. You have the Bitcoin tattoo and everything. I think it's awesome. But what would you say to people who say that Bitcoin is actually uh, dated technology compared to other newer cryptocurrencies that have higher speed, higher efficiency, higher transaction rate, more usability, uh, stuff like that, more decentralized, stuff like that? Yeah, um, it's a good question, and it's people get really confused. It seems like we port in the traditional financial wisdom of diversification when you come into crypto. It's like people think, oh, if Bitcoin is such a big deal and there's 30,000 other Bitcoins, then shouldn't I just buy a little bit of all of them and hope I catch the winning horse? But... As a, and we touched on the properties of money. So I'll try to keep my answer short. I'm not good at short answers, by the way. Uh, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. That's what you want money to do. Bitcoin has effectively perfected the properties of money. So the way I see it is that Satoshi, had, he created a tool that left no design space left for a competitor to introduce a superior feature set. It's just not there. If it was, if I'm wrong about that, Bitcoin is still open source code. So it can actually assimilate features. Like if, if shitcoin, excuse my French, 2.0 has some success in the marketplace and we figured out, oh, money also needs this feature, whatever it is, Bitcoin's open source code. It can absorb that feature. So when I look at the competitive landscape, I see an asset that's already established market dominance. It's perfected the properties of good money and it can absorb feature set from its competitors. I don't know how you compete with that. Did my best. 
Thank you. I'm a Catholic church musician, and uh, one of the travesties I see in the modern world is that our, our level of music and art in the church is like really banal, really low, and we have this amazing tradition of Western music and art. Uh, how do you see hard money, Bitcoin specifically, having an effect on art in the future? Love this question. Uh, again, I'll, I'll shout out the Bitcoin standard because he goes, I forget the name of the book that he's referencing, but he draws a causal pathway between, as we did today, with the debasement of money leading to the debasement of character and morality. Well, there's also the debasement of artistic creation. Um, again, if you're shrinking, if you're, if you're inducing people into consumerism, it's, it's much more likely you're going to get a banana duct taped on canvas at Art Basel sold for X hundred thousand dollars and call that fine art, right? That's, Joseph Campbell said something interesting, actually. The job of the artist is to mythologize the present for future generations. So maybe, just maybe, this fiat fiasco we're engaged in that induces us into consumerism becomes reflected in our art. Right, you end up with bananas duct taped on canvas. Um, and maybe if you tilt that incentive landscape the other way towards investment and saving, you end up with cathedrals that take 300 years to make. Right? The guy laying the bricks knows he's never going to see it completed, but he doesn't care because he's doing it for the glory of God. I think there's a connection there, but it's, that's a tenuous one, right? That's a hard line to draw. I like to try to focus more on the, the individual incentives uh, and their economic outcomes. But I think hard money would lead us back to a world with finer art, let's say. Thank you.